with Stuart Brand on New Green Nukes. Stuart was just telling me a little story about um, how he is an environmentalist, uh, has come to be where he is. He was telling me that years and years ago at family reunions, he would run into a nephew who worked at the main Yankee nuclear power plant and he would get into arguments with this nephew and Stuart was always very convinced that he was right and his nephew was absolutely wrong and he is gonna talk today about how he was wrong and his nephew was always right. Stuart, thank you. Thanks, Linda. Uh, just checking, we got the live mic, we got this mic, we're good to go. I've talked about nuclear a fair amount the last couple of years and realized that People would watch stuff I was showing. This is basically journalistic. And the book, Whole Earth Discipline, the, the nuclear chapter in it is basically journalistic. I'm just presenting stuff that I came across that uh, let me know that my nephew and his father were right and I was wrong. Um, but everybody is watching this stuff with uh, but what abouts in their mind. But what about the waste? But what about accidents? But what about radiation? So I'm gonna start with those and then get to the general picture of why nuclear is suddenly way greener than I thought or than many of us thought. I should say that uh, I really am an environmentalist. 61 years ago when I was 10 years old, I gave my pledge as an American to save and faithfully to defend from waste the natural resources of my country, its air, soil, and minerals, its forests, waters, and wildlife. And that was uh, outdoor life. That was back when conservation was something that conservatives, duck hunters and Teddy Roosevelt's and so on did. It's changed a bit since then, but uh, I haven't in that respect. I majored in ecology at Stanford, did the Whole Earth Catalog, and got involved in many of the early stages of the green movement. And I was, always was able to dismiss nuclear in my mind because I could say, well, I'm concerned about future generations, and gee, we can't burden future generations for 10,000 years or whatever with uh, this terrible waste that nuclear would leave behind. And so when climate came along, and I started paying attention to that, and that got me paying attention to coal and to nuclear. Uh, one of the first things I wanted to get straight about was what happens with nuclear waste. And the things we were always saying as environmentalists was, well, it's an unsolved problem. There's no place in the world that, that deals with nuclear waste yet. And obviously, until that's sorted out, we can't have nuclear power. And it's always weird to say that because nuclear power has been going on for over 40 years now and provides a whole lot of the cleanest electricity in the world. So there's an existence proof to deal with. So what about waste storage? Right now in the United States, Yucca Mountain, which I've been to, is no longer going to be the place to put nuclear waste. Uh, Obama said, forget it, and he's right. It's a completely politically wedged issue there. And so where nuclear waste goes now is where it's been going for the last several decades into dry cask storage out back of the parking lot at the reactor sites, where it's just fine. And it'll be fine there for 50 or 100 years while we think about what to do about it. Because there's lots of things to think about. If we decide that, we should, that we're just gonna stick with this once through approach, not try to reuse the fuel in the reprocess mode or not try to use it in the next generation of nuclear reactors that uses spent fuel as fuel, we do wanna put it in the ground, we can follow on what's been going on for 11 years in New Mexico at the WIP, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, where 10, now 11 years of military waste has been going half mile down into a salt formation that is 3,000 feet thick and works splendidly. It's wonderfully easy to mine the salt, um, easy to shape, and then it closes up around whatever you put there. This is what it looks like down there. The reason it was chosen as the site for the military waste, and I think should be the site for the civilian waste, is it's in this enormous salt formation called the Salado Formation that covers five states, 3,000 feet thick, it's been in that place for 250 million years. No water comes into it or goes out of it. So 
we put stuff down there, there's not much chance that somebody's going to go digging into a salt formation uh, expecting any surprises. If they go down half a mile into that salt formation and they find a surprise, I'd say they deserve it. And there are other uh, geological repositories going forward in Finland and Sweden and in France. So this is happening anyway. Meanwhile, President Obama has appointed a Blue Ribbon Commission since Yucca's off the table to go ahead and figure out a long-term policy for the U.S. for nuclear waste. One of the things they're considering, besides New Mexico, is what's called Deep Borehole Repository. It's an idea that's been around for a while. What's happened is the oil and gas industry now has the easy capability of drilling a hole, foot and a half wide, three miles plus deep. Geologically, when you go down two miles, you get down to what's called basement rock. Down in the basement rock, what water is there is saline, and it's heavy, so it never rises to the surface, never mixes with fresh water. It's extremely stable formations down there. And under most of the United States, you have basement rock down two miles. So you can go down there, drill down three miles, fill the bottom mile if you want, with vitrified spent fuel, pour in some concrete, and forget about it. One of the things I had to realize going through this process was realizing that geological time is a drastically different creature than civilized time. And millions of years are the norm there. So waste storage uh, is something you need to deal with, but it's not the main issue or the cosmic issue they thought it was. Another thing that gets thought about in kind of grand evil terms is radiation. And we're fearful about radiation when it has the word nuclear connected to it. That's why MRIs are called MRIs now instead of nuclear resonance. Uh, all the medical stuff, we see, we see a lot of radiation, mostly used either for treatment or for diagnosis in medicine. In the nuclear business, uh, radiation is very familiar to the folks who work there. This is basically the safety manual that a reactor site set to music. And the engineers and managers who work in these places have a profoundly cautious relationship to the whole thing. They are engineers with of great technical skill and patience, and they are the opposite of Homer Simpson. Now, they are not allowed to let more than 15 millirems of radiation get out to the world a year. That sounds like either a lot or a little, depending on context. So for context, here in Aspen, background radiation is about 364 millirems a year. If you came here from Connecticut, you just broke the federal rules five times because you get five times as much radiation here as you get in Connecticut. When you go for a mammogram, you get twice the 15 millirems. When you get a CT scan, you get 1,000 millirems. If you smoke, it isn't the radiation that'll kill you. It's the smoke, but nevertheless, you're going to get 1,300 millirems a year. Ten times that is background radiation in a town in, in, in uh, Iran called Ramsar, and there is no special uh, behavior that you can see in, in medical epidemiology there. The people there are as healthy as anywhere else. And then any astronaut that goes on a shuttle mission um, is expected to get 25,000 millirems, and they don't have any extra health problems. When Chernobyl came along, and still since, Greenpeace continues to use photographs of deformed babies. It says they're from the Chernobyl area, that it says were caused by radiation from that steam explosion. And at the time, the late John Kaufman said that, that there would be at least 500,000 early cancer deaths caused by radiation that came out of Chernobyl. Early in this decade, the United Nations sent nine different organizations in what was called the UN Chernobyl Forum and they did the on-the-ground study, the epidemiology, and found that there were exactly no extra congenital deformations in children coming out of that, no birth defects. By the way, that was also the case after Nagasaki and Hiroshima. 
And as far as cancer, they could not detect epidemiologically any extra cancer in the exposed population. Now there's a sort of a theory of, called the linear no threshold theory that suggests that very low dosage over a long time will cause at least some cancers, but they've never been measured, so they're guessed to be uh, maybe out of the 600,000 people most exposed, there might be 4,000 extra cancers. That's so small you can't detect it. This was not something done by the industry. It was done by, well, the organizations include the World Health Organization, the United Nations Scientific Committee on Effects of Atomic Radiation, the United Nations Environment Program, the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, and the Food and Agriculture Organization. They found deep problems with people in the area, and it was all economic and somewhat psychological because they had been told they were victims of a terrible thing. But in fact, only 56 people died that we know of from Chernobyl, 47 of them workers, nine children uh, who had thyroid cancer that was untreated. As soon as the treatment started coming in, they got total remission, the rest of the children, and that's been the extent of the injuries from Chernobyl. On the ground, it looks pretty bad. But if you go there now, and it's becoming more and more a place to go, what you get is the wolves have come back. It's Europe's richest wildlife preserves. It has beavers, lynx, and deer, the rare animals like white-tailed eagle and the black stork. Uh, the, they've reintroduced some of the most endangered uh, remaining European megafauna, the European horse, and or sorry, the European bison and Shabalski's horse. And one biologist from Texas who spent 10 years working on the, studying the animals in the red forest, where all the evergreens had died from radiation, um, what he found was that there was very little harm to the animals and it decreased. It was, of course, that whole area is back to background radiation now. Uh, but it became a wildlife refuge because people stopped doing their usual thing of having town and farming and logging and the rest of it. And he said, it can be said, that the world's worst nuclear power plant disaster is not as destructive to wildlife populations as our normal human activities. So my expectation is that within a decade, we will be going to visit Chernobyl National Park. And we should. It will be great. It's great on all accounts. It is an historic place. Now I'm going to tell something that I don't tell everybody, but this group might be able to handle it. <laughs> Um, I don't exactly know what to make of it, but I'll tell you the facts as, as they've been reported. There's a thing called radiation hormesis, the idea that radiation might be good for you. It was first discovered in the rats, and then there came to be what is uh, known as, to scientists, as a natural experiment. In Taiwan, there were, 1983, a bunch of cobalt-60 uh, was built into the metallic steel in a bunch of apartment buildings. And 10,000 people who were lived in those buildings were exposed to a decade of 1,300 millirems a year, sorry, for 20 years. That accumulative dose, if radiation damage accumulates over time, they were getting somewhere between various people, 40,000 to 600,000 millirems. Well, 400,000 millirems in an acute dose is what kills you. So potentially, these people you know, should be getting something pretty serious happening to them. Comparative studies were made by these Taiwanese doctors and researchers. They compared 10,000 comparable people who had not been exposed and tried to figure out what an extra cancer rate might be. And they decided from making those comparative figures that of the 10,000 exposed, they should have seen in the study period 232 extra cancers if it was exactly the same. They knew they'd been exposed to a lot of radiation, so then the question is, what multiple would occur on that? And, uh, of course, the number that came out of that uh, was seven. Seven cancers instead of the larger number, which means that the people who were exposed to the radiation in these apartment buildings were having 3% the cancer rate of the normal Taiwan residents. Uh, the study was called, uh, Is Chronic Radiation an Effective Prophylaxis Against Cancer? It was published in the Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons in spring 2004. And whether it's a one-off, whether it's something weird that these 14 authors were all uh, bamboozled, 
remains to be seen, but radiation hormesis that it's too bad if you're not getting enough radiation. <laughs> and you know, maybe you should be getting, one of the figures is maybe you should be getting at least 6,000 6, milligrams a year uh, as a way to stay healthy. If that's the case, then we'd have no problem what to do with our spent fuel. We can just package it up and sell it to people to put underneath their beds. <laughs> so radiation, again, which looked like this enormous evil, is basically uh, a design problem, but not as huge a one as we thought. So next question always is, but, but what about accidents? And uh, the classic one is Three Mile Island. Uh, two weeks after that movie came out, The China Syndrome, Three Mile Island uh, blew. It had a classic meltdown. This was the worst case scenario, a meltdown in a reactor in the United States. So what actually happened is that uh, in the reactor vessel, this is uh, debris that occurred after the meltdown, and uh, it stopped a little short of China, five-eighths of an inch into the reactor vessel, uh, where the whole act operation acted the way it was supposed to, which was that it would disperse and cool down uh, the melt, and it uh, cooled off. Well, it destroyed the reactor. There was a tiny bit of atmospheric radiation released, which turned out to have insignificant effects, and that was it. Well, okay, maybe Three Mile Island wasn't as bad as we thought, and it's interesting that the industry hasn't had any meltdowns like that since, not here, not anywhere else. But all this talk about spent fuel, suppose we're trying to take the spent fuel to New Mexico or Yucca back in the day. Uh, what happens if something happens to those spent fuel containers on the way? So Sandia Labs, who gets to have all the fun, Shipping uh, containers have been loaded the onto studies. a truck that was crashed, first at 60 miles per hour and then at 80 miles per hour, into a 700-ton concrete wall. They have been broadsided by a 120-ton locomotive traveling at 80 miles per hour. Another physical test involved dropping containers in a 30-foot freefall onto steel-reinforced concrete, comparable to hitting a concrete slab head-on at 120 miles an hour. They've been dropped onto a six inch diameter spike and the containers have been burned in a pool of aviation fuel for 90 minutes at temperatures of more than 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. The result in each case, there were no ruptures or significant damage to the used fuel containers themselves. Although dented and charred, the containers remain totally intact to protect the used fuel they would carry. Well, okay, that's all very well, but suppose terrorists get a, a Phantom F4 jet and ram it right into a reactor site. The plane atomized with the impact. It just disappeared into dust. Only the tips of the wings escaped total destruction. This is what an airplane does when it impacts a nuclear containment building with a four foot thick concrete wall. Basically, an airplane is a bubble. The 9-11 airplane was a bubble that ran into another bubble and was filled with enough fuel to get inside that second bubble, the Twin Towers, to set them aflame, and that's what brought them down. So, and they're really small tires. It's pretty easy to hit the Twin Towers uh, if you're an amateur pilot with a big jet hitting one of these tiny reactors right in the right spot uh, would take a lot of it, focus and effort, and plus you get nothing out of it. What about weapons proliferation? That's a long story. It would be a whole talk in its own right, and there'll be some discussion about that um, later in the week. But one of the interesting things that has emerged is the very quietly done megatons to megawatts program of four 12 years or so now, we have quietly been buying up warheads, nuclear warheads from Russia, converting them uh, to nuclear fuel, and half of our nuclear energy, 20% of American energy is nuclear, half of that comes from these weapons. In other words, nuclear energy has dismantled more nuclear weapons than any other activity. And there's a good chance that as things go forward with things like the what is called the fuel banking approach that uh, President Obama has pushed is that new countries, as they come into the nuclear age, and dozens of them are busy doing that, 
they don't have to get into the, new, the, into the fuel problem because they'll be able to rent nuclear fuel from an international consortium, use it, and then instead of trying to worry about whether to reprocess it or bury it or whatever, they just give it back to the consortium. What is great about that is that all of the fissile material then is kept track of on a global basis in a way that pays for itself. This is a way to start heading off any possibility of loose nukes and keeping a track of programs like Iran's uh, as they go forward. Most other countries are saying they want nothing to do with looking like they have uh, any connection with nuclear weapons, and that is a workaround on that. So I want to sort of balance all of this explosions and accidents and stuff with what the reality is. I grew up in Rockford, Illinois. Uh, 17 miles to the south is the Byron nuclear plant. It's uh, got two one gigawatt reactors that provides electricity for two million homes without any greenhouse gases coming out of it. Illinois as a state has more than 50% of its electricity coming from nuclear. That's one of the reasons that Barack Obama, who cut his political teeth in Illinois, is familiar and comfortable with this technology, as much of the world is, because we've been doing it for four decades now. We're good at it, and we're getting better all the time. In the U.S., we have 104 reactors. Around the world, there are 443 reactors in 31 countries. And every year, a new country is coming on, and that number is starting to accelerate, mainly because of climate change, but for all the other reasons of getting good, clean, base load power. The reactors that are out there now are keeping 3 billion tons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere that would otherwise have gone there from, carbon, or from uh, coal burning plants. So that's the nuclear reality. I sort of started with that, and now I come to the world reality. World reality is we have climate change facing us, and we have a world that is now half urban and rapidly moving toward 80% urban, probably by mid-century. Who's in the world? Five out of six of us live in the developing world, where lives are changing drastically, mostly for the better. As people move into town, they create jobs, they're educating their kids, and the countries are building serious energy infrastructure. Uh, so are the poor people. They will get electricity any way they can. It is so important. And uh, they'll steal it if need be. In most of the slums and swatter cities, uh, you'll see this kind of uh, effective stealing of infrastructure. A billion people live in the squatter cities and slums around the world. A billion more are expected. This is basically good news. They're moving there on purpose to get the hell out of uh, the situation they're stuck in in the country. They're moving to the bright lights. What keeps the bright lights on uh, is electricity. All squatter cities eventually wind up looking like this. Denver was like the first shot. San Francisco was, New York was, Chicago was. Now they look like this. So, and that happens in just a few decades. So what you are seeing is a whole lot of need for city-type electricity, for baseload electricity. Baseload electricity is electricity that is always on. It's not... Um, inconsistent the way solar has been and wind has been. If we get great storage for those, then they can become baseload, but in the meantime, they're not. Hydro, which us environmentalists used to fight ferociously, um, is one source of clean, but most places are maxed out on hydro. Uh, the rest is nuclear, and so far we have no other source of clean baseload electricity. Now we get down to the fundamental green issue, which is that what you need to do is compare the waste stream that comes out of nuclear with the waste stream that comes out of coal-fired. Looks like this. If all of the electricity you got in your entire lifetime uh, was in one place from nuclear, that waste would be the size of a, nuclear, of a Coke can, about two pounds, of, which is, of course, the same amount of fuel. But with coal, uh, you've got a normal one gigawatt plant, which is about the size of a large coal plant. 80 rail cars a day, each with 100 tons of coal. 8,000 tons of coal a day turning into 16,000 tons of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere every day. Where does it go? And that's kind of doesn't sound like the right comparison. So let's compare a year of one gigawatt nuclear and a year of one gigawatt coal. 20 tons, tons of nuclear fuel becomes 20 tons of waste, 3 million tons of coal becomes 6 million tons of carbon dioxide. 
And instead of going into a nice safe place where you can keep an eye on it, it goes into everybody's atmosphere where it's hell to get it back. And when you compare the lifetime emissions of these various sources per kilowatt hour, nuclear is better than hydro and wind and well ahead of solar so far, unless solar gets a lot better. So one of the reasons a lot of scientifically oriented, engineering oriented greens have come around to nuclear, the same reason a lot of climatologists have, James Hansen being a classic case. Um, he's the guy who has said we need to get our parts per million from what we are now at 380 something down to 350 and leave it there forever uh, in order to have a really stable climate. Uh, instead is headed toward 450 and beyond. And that's one of the reasons he, like almost all the other major climatologists are saying we've got to go nuclear, go nuclear soon, fast and large. And um, this is a classic case that usually you find that with climate scientists, the ones who know the most about climate are the most worried with nuclear people, the ones who know the most, most about nuclear are the least worried. I feel a little bit that environmentalists haven't been as focused on coal as we should have been. You know, we picked up on things like turning Appalachia upside down, which is disgraceful on any count, um, but also the mercury that is in everybody's bloodstream now, and the, the reason that Pregnant women aren't supposed to eat wild fish and shellfish is because of the mercury that's coming out of the coal-fired plants all over the world. And that's a direct poisoning effect we are having. Now, recently I was in a, uh, or I am trying to stop coal. Uh, this was in Newcastle, England about a month ago. And I was in front of the largest such machine for digging up the landscape and going for the, it is now to the point where a seam just three or four feet thick of coal is worth digging up the landscape to get. Now, as of course, when it comes to a fight between me and a machine like that, I lose. Everybody loses against coal because it is so cheap. And we can say that it's great in the US that we've only built 12 new coal plants in the entire country since 1990, but we have 1,493 in operation, like these along the Ohio River. One of the arguments been against nuclear keeps being, well, it's, it's too expensive. And that's why uh, market forces are gonna keep nuclear from coming to the fore. Well, market forces brought coal to the fore and will keep it to the fore because coal is cheap. I've been persuaded since I wrote the book that clean coal is probably something that should be pursued even though it looks pretty gnarly because everybody's gonna keep burning coal because it is so damn cheap compared to everything else. So nuclear is expensive compared to coal so is wind, so is solar, so is anything else we might come up with, so is gas. So besides pursuing clean coal, the sense I get is that we have to have some form of carbon tax on, carbon, on coal and carbon generally. And it needs to happen in the places that light up the world, which is Europe, us, China, and India. If those four governments figure out some way to make coal expensive, then we have a shot. If they don't, and they don't find a way to clean it up, then I'm not sure how we're gonna manage. Because in China, their coal output is twice the United States. It's um, looking at a number from Pew Center, 2.2 billion tons a year in 2005. 80% of their electricity comes from coal. Uh, their Atmosphere in many places is approximately opaque, and the much quoted number of them building two large coal power plants, new ones, a week, is still pretty much the case. So one can be glad that they are starting to build more nuclear plants, and they are shutting down some of the oldest and dirtiest of the coal-fired plants. They've got a long way to go. Okay, slight change of subject. Wind is great. Solar is great. Uh, my wife and I use solar in our lives uh, of great effect. Solar on rooftops is one of the best things there is. There are a lot of people who don't like the, the, the look of uh, wind in Cape Cod Sound, mainly, but uh, I think wind's kind of thrilling. When you get up too close, it's a little weird, but the thing to know is wind, like sun, is a very dilute energy source. 
And so to get just one gigawatt, just one normal coal-fired plant, one normal nuclear reactor, uh, takes 250 square miles of industrialized landscape. Now you can do other stuff under there. The cattle don't seem to mind it too much. Turns out people aren't really happy living under these things. Birds don't like it much, but birds mostly get killed by pesticides, cats, cars, and buildings. Um, nevertheless, and then you've got these power lines coming from the inconvenient places where the wind is to the places where people are. Likewise with solar, again, it's very dilute. And so on the rooftops, it's a nice supplement, but to do serious solar farms where you're going to get, try to get one gigawatt coming out of that, you're talking about 50 square miles of desert or some place that has a lot of sun being bulldozed. If you do solar thermal, which is the most efficient, uh, that's great, except it uses a lot of water. And where you get a lot of sun is deserts, but that's not a place you have a lot of water, and what water there is, people fight over. So I am basically, I guess, most affected by the kind of figures that Saul Griffith comes up with. Saul was here last year, and his numbers are saying that, look, to even level off at 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, in the next 25 years, we have to have 13 trillion watts, 13 terawatts of new clean energy. And you can do it with, you know, 30,000 square miles of uh, solar electric panels, 15,000 square miles of solar thermal mirrors, uh, 100,000 square miles of a wind farm, uh, 1.5 million square miles of engineered algae, um, 27,000 steam turbines, and that only gets you 10 terawatts. So to, just to fill out the extra three, you said, how about 3,900? one gigawatt reactors. This sounds approximately impossible. Technically and industrially, as he pointed out here, I'm sure it is not impossible. Political, it is, politically, it is hard to imagine. Someone who did the same thing on a smaller scale in an even more accessible form is uh, David Mackay, uh, who has this wonderful book called Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, where he just figured out exactly what it will take for England to uh, stop emitting greenhouse gases in the production of electricity. And it takes no end of wind and solar and uh, damming up estuaries to get tidal power and uh, wave power if they can ever figure out a way to do it. And as he says, I'm not trying to be pro-nuclear, I'm just pro-arithmetic. He added up, you cannot do these things without including nuclear, so it's part of the mix. I think that nuclear can be pretty green. So it, uh, we have a, a coastal site near Los Angeles called Diablo Canyon. And like all of the reactor sites, they are permitted to put in more reactors if they want to. So that, that, that speeds up the process. That's cool. So if they put in a, a fast reactor, a hot reactor, uh, you could move right on to a very green package where the place was not only producing electricity, which we could put in all the plug-in hybrids we're going to have in California any second, and hydrogen for Governor Schwarzenegger, and fresh water for uh, Los Angeles, which is currently draining the Colorado River. And the spent fuel, instead of going into the ground, can be just reused as fuel in the hot. And all of that time, uh, you're not putting out greenhouse gases. That starts to be a kind of a green package. I have run this by Pacific Gas and Electric, and they uh, their eyes cross. <laughs> they are not always an extra large size anymore. This is something Al Gore keeps saying, it only comes an extra large. Well, a large reactor like the one from Arriva is about 1.6 gigawatts, uh, 1.6 billion watts. But there's now small ones coming along, like 25 uh, watt reactor. 25 megawatt is 25 million watts, 164th the size. It's about what you need for one small town. These are called small modular reactors. There's a whole swarm of designs coming along. And what's neat about them is they live up to the green idea that energy should be locally produced, small, distributed, and in the form of micropower. This is a classic micropower form, only it's 24-7 and very clean. The way they work is typically they're manufactured in a factory, taken by train or truck to the site, rotated 90 degrees, stuck in the ground. The ground becomes the, the uh, containment vessel for it. Uh, they're very simple designs with few things, therefore so many fewer things to go wrong that they are meltdown proof. Uh, the way they work with the fuel, they're proliferation proof. 
and uh, they are moving through a very fast design cycle and very financeable. Russians are moving ahead rapidly uh, with some floating barge small reactors. They're doing this because the ice is melting north of Russia. Uh, what's called the Northern Sea Route is opening up. They're pouring concrete for a series of ports along that route, and the way they'll power them is with these barges. Uh, various coastal countries in the developing world are interested in buying some as well. Uh, here's an American design come from the Lawrence Livermore Lab. Uh, another American design from the Los Alamos. Uh, this one called Hyperion. There's some question amongst the aficionados whether this one is real, but if it is, it's amazing. It's so small. Uh, a very classic one in Oregon is New Scale. All of these are built to be um, modular, as they say. So you can buy one, stick it in the ground, turn it on, it works, get another one, slave it right next to it, keep bolting them on as you need more power. This, again, makes it a much more financial, financially feasible proposition. One of the oldest players in the game, Babcock and Wilcox, have been making Navy reactors for 50 years out of Virginia, uh, have come up with their version of uh, small modular. It's 125 megawatt, and uh, it's a complete plug and play with its own steam generator. Bear in mind, all these things are tea kettles. Uh, it's one of the strangest things about generating electricity is it's still done with spinning magnets, except with photovoltaic solar. And the way we usually spin the magnets, magnets is with steam turbines. Getting a little further out, <clears throat> here's a uh, integral fast reactor, fourth generation reactor. Not a big thing, but it could be as small as 100 megawatts. There's a company here in the US who wants to move ahead with this. <clears throat> One of the advantages is it's small, uh, it's hot enough to desalinate water to generate hydrogen if you want to use that in your vehicles. And of course, it burns nuclear waste. Nathan Mervold and his group at Intellectual Ventures in Seattle has been pushing ahead uh, with a couple of designs. One of this is uh, thorium reactor design uh, came from Lowell Wood. And um, basically the idea here is you buy one of these, you stick it in the ground, um, it doesn't need refueling, you run it on thorium for 60 years, and then just leave it there. It is its own little sarcophagus. Uh, it's, thorium is, there's a, if you go to Google or places in Silicon Valley, people will bit flatten your ear about thorium, that the thorium reactors are gonna be the solution to everything. Fast reactors, the integral fast reactors are the classic fourth generation reactors that are supposed to be coming along. And China is moving along rapidly, so is India, so is Japan. And we were, until the Clinton administration shut down our research on an integral fast reactor uh, in 1994. Stephen Chu, the Secretary of Energy, wants to move ahead rapidly on this, and we should. Fourth generation reactors have enormous advantages. Um, good is the first, the first three generations, well, the th third generation is what we're using now, and they're damn good, but they can be um, more efficient, safer, and much more economical uh, as you move from generation to generation in this mature technology. Bill Gates recently went public saying that the, wish, the greatest wish he has for the world would be to have zero greenhouse gas emissions source of electricity. That is the best thing we could do for everybody, especially for the poor in the world, which is where he's focused these days. And so one of the things that he, working with in intellectual ventures, is uh, interested in is called the traveling wave reactor. This, again, is a reactor that you uh, can basically leave alone for 50 to 100 years, never needs refueling. It's just feeding its own constantly moving reaction in there. That's not the far out part. Here's the far out part. I didn't have anything about fusion in my book. But then I got uh, invited to visit the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore Lab in California. And I saw this piece of what they call technological sublime, an amazingly beautiful, large, very well-crafted machine which has the intent of getting a fusion reaction using lasers in the next couple months. Because I'd always been hearing of the joke, yeah, but, I mean, everybody's supposed to like fusion. The nuclear guys like fusion because it'll sort of be the millennium for them. And the green guys always felt safe saying, well, fusion would be great, but as we all know, uh, it's 40 years in the future and always will be. And even though you know, it's zero mining because you burn hydrogen, 
Uh, there's zero waste stream. There's zero meltdown capability. There's zero weapon capability. You know, all these things that make it look as clean as you can possibly imagine. Um, sorry, it's never going to happen. Well, what they're doing at the National Ignition Facility is to take a tiny little bit, about the size of a BB of deuterium, and bombard it with a whole lot of laser power at one point, and uh, get ignition, and then go from there. If they get ignition that way, then there's the possibility of having a fusion reactor in this decade, in the next 10 years, a prototype, that would be all of these clean things that we've loved to see. Here's how it works. Three, two, one, shot. So the shot works like this. So we're gonna multiply the laser energy a million billion times in five millionths of a second. The uh, oscillators are fired up and the signal uh, to the capacitance, the signal takes off. It divides into 48 preamplifiers in the laser base. You get a slug of light that is 20 feet long, one nanosecond long. It bounces back and forth four times, which is part of what keeps this condensed in the main amplifier. Then the 48 beams are divided into 192 beams. Let's get more sound, that's kind of dramatic. The 192 20 foot lengths of light head to the switch yard where they will be coordinated to all arrive simultaneously in a perfect spherical configuration at the target chamber. The last minute is converted to ultraviolet light, converges on that BB. At that focus, you get 500 trillion watts for 20 billionths of a second. That creates an X-ray oven at 200 million degrees Fahrenheit, and that implodes the BB, and that gives you fusion. And that fusion should give a release of energy 10 to 100 times of the energy you put into it. And it's clean. So if we can do reactors like that, that uh, will make great things happen. So when I talk to the nuclear professionals, occasionally they do pay me, but they don't pay me to talk to you about nuclear. They pay me to come and talk to them about being green. Because uh, now that they are the leading environmentalists in terms of climate in the world, uh, I say, fellow environmentalists, there's more you can do. Uh, get involved with the organization. Don't give them large quantities of money. That will taint them and you. But do, get, do participate. And likewise, uh, hire young people. Avoid greenwash. You know, this is the Nuclear Energy Institute pretending that it's uh, uh, really, really green and uh, it just looks like they're lying. For environmentalists, the glow-in-the-dark environmentalists, I think that we have a lot we can do. We can insist on nuclear plants being open to the public, as they are in Europe. Uh, they're tremendously reassuring and interesting places to visit. The push the various forms of next generation green reactors that are coming on. 4% of greenhouse gases come from commercial ships. Those could be, many of them, nuclear powered, and that would help. Push the nuclear banking and uh, move in the direction, frankly, of de-weaponizing nuclear permanently. I think that's what we really want. So going back to the Ohio River where all those coal-fired plants are, here's a nuclear plant. The nuclear renaissance is really coming on. So places like Sweden that were going to shut down all their nuclear reactors are not only keeping them all on, after all, but expanding their capacity. Finland uh, ordered two huge reactors and then ordered two more. Britain, the Labour Party said we need 10 reactors. The Conservative Party that just came in said we need more than that. Italy had shut down all of its reactors and then got tired of buying nuclear energy from France and they planned to build four new reactors and then move on from there. And so it goes around the world. China is talking about as many as 400 reactors, four times what we have. India is talking about as many as 300 reactors. This is a renaissance <clears throat> that is really going on. 
Um, this time it is intentionally green instead of inadvertently green like it was the first time around, and thoroughly green, and I think we should help it. Thank you. Questions? Uh, and there's going to be a microphone that comes around to wherever you are. So uh, who's got a question? Back here. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Um, I have uh, a technical question. I'm not an engineer. And I have a financial question. Uh, the technical question is, I was looking at sources and uses of energy, the Department of Energy's uh, a chart that shows sources of uses of energy in the United States and showed that it has approximately, that we use about 100 quadrillion BTUs a year. And what struck me is that about half of that, according to the Department of Energy, is lost energy in transmission or being burned off in various other things. So it seems to me, it's just an issue that you didn't address, that we are generating a lot of energy through transportation for heating, for electricity, and a lot of other things, and then wasting half of it uh, through various properties of physics and through sloppiness on our part. So I'd like you to uh, comment on that. And secondly, it's my well, Let's go to that for a minute. Okay, all right. And then hold the second question. Okay. Um, I should have said that one of the great attractions of the small modular reactors is they, you have the power source close to the customers. So you don't have these extensive power lines. And one of the things we're learning in the US right now is putting in new power lines is approximately impossible because people just say, I'm not going to let my property go. I'm not going to let my view go. Forget about it. As you say, there are a lot of inefficiencies still in the system. And uh, that is always the first place to start, is taking inefficiencies out of the system, finding ways to conserve energy. It's the cheapest way to head off greenhouse gases. Well, it's not cheap. But you make money usually when you do it. So you know, this whole talk could have been about conservation and efficiency, but it would be better given by Amory Lovins. So you know, he's coming later. He can do it. Um, it is wonderful the amount of design intelligence that is being focused on all of these issues at every step of the way. And one of the things that's emerged that I learned about recently is that the conventional power lines that we see swooping across the landscape and losing 20 to 40 percent of their energy on the way, uh, there are now some high, basically high concentration ones that are drastically more efficient. Uh, for example, <laughs> two gigawatts flows from France to England that's nuclear, and it does that through the channel and, and instead of swooping across the landscape in a very intense form of very low loss. If it is ever the case that Europe needs to get its energy from vast solar farms in North Africa, there would be that kind of transmission, hopefully, that would do it. So all of these design problems need to be stated in exactly the terms you did, and then go on that by engineers, and the greener the engineers are, I figure the better they're going to be at heading off ancillary effects of tearing up the landscape and so on. What else? Uh, my oh, sorry, your second question. Well, just very quickly. Then Toby. My understanding is that the nuclear industry continues to request the government to exempt it from certain liabilities in order to bring the financing in line. Uh, why, if the situation is so, the technology is so safe and so beneficial, is it so difficult to get it insured, and do we have to put that burden on the taxpayers as a, a mechanism for advancing the industry, if I'm correct in that, and what I understand to be the case? Um, it's not that dangerous, so you know, either the insurance guys are out to lunch, or maybe the industry should figure out its own way of insuring each other. But you know, all these countries in the world that have nuclear have not had issues. This may be one of those Specialty, uh, American specialties that Neil Ferguson likes to rail on about. That, uh, we make things hard for ourselves. Toby. Uh, could you talk about the capital expense mm -hmm. of nuclear plants, particularly as compared to some of the other options? Capital expense is the... Uh, is... is <laughs> that all environmentalists talk about capital expense of nuclear plants is, uh, is largely the product of a neighbor here uh, over at Old Snowmass. Amory Lovins has been very effectively arguing that this is the thing which uh, should prevent nuclear from happening. Um, it's, a, it's a little tricky because his logic requires that what we 
know is that the intelligence of Wall Street is what we can rely on. And if they're not going to loan money to uh, these nuclear plants, that must mean that they're a bad idea because we know that Wall Street is always right about things like that. That's a little questionable. But nevertheless, you, know, you can sort of see it play out. The other funny, you know, bear in mind what Amory is doing there is using what he knows best, which is the superb financial and economic arguments for conservation and efficiency. Go ahead with that. So he's taking that good tool and applying it to nuclear. That being the case, one would expect Amory to be very interested in the small modular reactors because they basically step right up to the financing question. You can do it a step at a time, you can do it cheaply. They're manufactured instead of built on site, so there's drastic savings there. Um, but so far, Amory Levins has said two things that I think are, are incorrect. One is uh, he, he thinks they're fundamentally fantasy. The small modular reactors uh, have no application, so he doesn't need to do his financial uh, analysis on it because they'll never happen. You know, that can be said for not much longer, I think. The other thing he's been saying for a long time is that nuclear is doomed. Uh, it's always been doomed. He's been saying it for 30 years. He still says it now as this renaissance is taking off. I take that as a, if he was wrong about that, then you sort of work upstream on the logic for, well, what else was he wrong about to get that conclusion wrong? Which leaves one thing extra. Environmentalists don't give a shit about money. You know, we've never been good. We do not care about ratepayers or taxpayers. It's not our job. Our job is protecting the natural environment. And uh, do not ask what a condor is worth. A condor is worth whatever it costs to save it. And if we're going to do uh, an environmental impact report on this wonderful real estate project that you want to do, we don't care how much it costs or how long it takes to get through the process. So the idea that environmentalists are suddenly being real financially responsible, responsible is... So I say, fine, it's a good tactic, and it has worked very well, but what are you really afraid of? Because we know you're not in the business of protecting taxpayers and ratepayers. This is going to be interesting when I go right down the place plan. Um, I think they're worried about the things that we are worried about, which is spent fuel, the waste, where do we put it? They're worried about radiation. They're worried about the things that I started with, which I am persuaded as an environmentalist, are not as bad as I thought they were. So if what that leaves environmentalists like Amory with is a, a means now as an end. Their means of you know, focusing on the finance as a way to stop this particular technology now has become their end because the other stuff that was an end doesn't apply. So I think that's the why you are seeing more and more environmentalists sort of getting not quite so been out of shape about it, or falling back on a kind of a theological stance of, but nuclear is evil, we know that. And then you say, well, who knows that better than Japan? Japan is 30% nuclear for its electricity and wants to be 60% nuclear. So what just happened? Uh, another question. No, we should go probably pretty soon. Uh, right here. And then you. You want to stand up and say who you sure. are? Sure. Uh, sorry, Michael Anchel, Remodeling Magazine, Hanleywood Media. Um, the question I had was uh, thorium. Mm. Uh, I've read a couple of articles. Wired did a piece on it recently. Um, is it a reality? Is it something that we should be waiting for? Or is it, is it uh, get started now building fourth gen fast breeder and then introduce thorium as it's As one of the fuels. Developed? Yeah. And is, is, does it actually work, exist, et cetera, et cetera? There is a... Um, I hope it's not like straw bale houses, <laughs> which everybody was going to build a few years ago, and then a few people did and found out what happens when the moisture gets into the straw. Um, the place I would most watch for thorium is India. India has large quantities of thorium. You can pick it up off the beach. And uh, so they're moving ahead. They want to be the thorium reactor builders for the world, and they may well be. People at Google and elsewhere who've read the Wired article are persuaded that thorium is where we should have gone in the first place instead of with uranium, and uh, we should now, and it can be wonderful. And I, you know, they may well be right. I just see it as part of this panoply of good, greener nuclear technology that's coming our way to get us real greenhouse gas-free electricity, and that's the main thing. I, I've got no particular 
thing about nuclear. I do have a thing about climate. I do have a thing about natural systems. And so, uh, you know, fusion comes along rapidly enough that nuclear is just the bridge to that, and then that can disperse in various forms. That's ever so much better. Uh, if we can get storage for wind and solar, that would be great. So thorium is one of the things. You had a question. Um, hi, my question relates to, I suppose, how Hollywood created fear in the yeah. mind of the average individual through the China syndrome and, as you say, two, two weeks later, um, our worst fears were, in fact, confirmed. You have painted a very um, rational and a logical argument, and my question is, would we not be better off going back to our storytellers in Hollywood and ask them to help us with this painting a new story? Isn't it time for a new story to make it to the world? It's a wonderful question, and I think it's a wonderful request to the world. Um, and it goes back further than, than uh, China Syndrome. The 50s, when I was growing up, when atomic was everything, um, all of the science fiction movies of the day and many of the science fiction stories had as the, the, the evildoer, the villain, the, the great danger that happened was you know, enormous ants, them, that were created by being uh, near a uh, bomb test site. Back then it was bomb tests that we were worried about, which really were putting out vast quantities of radiation. I'm glad that stopped. But what you built in place then was this those stories build in a fear. Here's one of the things that, that fear brought about. We were told that birth defects resulted from exposure to radiation. And we all assumed that the children of the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were having these two-headed babies or something like that. And there was a deep fear. And it, it's a deep, it's a mother fear. It's a correct mother fear something that might endanger the children. So in, you know, long, deep studies were done of all of the survivors of those two places that we bombed. In terms of cancer, if you survived the first month, you were less likely to die of cancer of other people who lived elsewhere. <laughs> and there may have been one of these weird hormesis things going on, but it may well have been just because you were being really well studied. But they didn't find any extra birth defects. But that story was never told, either by Hollywood or anyone else. So when Chernobyl happened, there was a lot of damage to unborn children. And it was done by their parents. There were tens of thousands of abortions that were had by everybody who thought they were somehow downwind of Chernobyl and that it was going to damage their babies, their fetuses, and they aborted them, which is common in Ukraine and that part of the world anyway. In Russia, seven out of ten women have had, on average, seven abortions. So it's the thing you do. Nevertheless, those babies should have been born because <laughs> they were okay. And what killed them was not radiation. It was killed, killed them was fear of radiation. Now, I don't know that this story will be told in fiction, but I do know of four documentaries going forward by very responsible characters uh, who make good documentaries, feature length in some of the cases, that are basically trying to tell sort of the same truth I'm telling about nuclear. Uh, there's a wonderful movie called Earth Days made by uh, director Robert Stone. And in the course of researching Earth Days, I'm in it so I know about this, uh, he came across all of this nuclear material. And so the next documentary he wants to do is basically about the nuclear renaissance, why it's happening and why it's good. And that's kind of my news here today. There's a nuclear renaissance happening. It's good. Let's make it as green as possible. Thank you very much.